Y no te me hagas, eh, que en cover de vivo tú has visto mi cara, eh, no salgo de tu mente, donde quiera que viajes has escuchado mi gente. Hello. Ya no soy high, high, soy como el testa rosa, no soy el que se... Good afternoon, sisters and brothers and everyone. My name is Yvonne Weldon. I am a sovereign Radri woman. I come from Cara here in New South Wales, from the waters of the Clare, which is also known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I am the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land that we are on. I would like to pay my respects to all elders past and present, to all First Nations and to you and the many nations of lands you travel from today. We are meeting here on the lands of the Eora. The boundaries are the Hawkes River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal. I acknowledge the Gadigal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with these lands, our Mother Earth. Across this beautiful continent of ours, there are hundreds of nations, tribes and clans existing here for over 60,000 years. The First Nations of this land are the most diverse, unique and sustainable people on the planet. We are the oldest living culture of the world. And as we're all joined here for this important event, let us remember the LGBTQI plus friends that have suffered, the ones walking beside us and others soon to be following in our footsteps. We must make our society, our world inclusive breaking through barriers and not creating them. Together, we can bring about positive changes to multiple generations. As an ally, I wholeheartedly support the LGBTQI plus friends and communities. Your rights, your marriages, your happiness and your choice, your way on your terms. Creating a future for the next generations, for everyone in this country. As it is Pride Month, continue to stand strong, loud and deadly because we are proudly standing with you. So let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal Land. This always was, always will be. Aboriginal land. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Yvonne, and hello, everybody. Welcome to Queer Thinking, Religious Discrimination and the Fight Ahead. I'm Fran Kelly, your host and moderator for this event, presented by Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras in partnership with Equality Australia. It's great to be celebrating Pride Month with you all as part of this Pride, Mardi Gras Pride Weekender, a two-day extravaganza, how good is that, featuring four terrific events right here at the Metro Theatre, which is back better than ever after closing doors for over a year. Bloody COVID, eh? Today, we're going to be discussing the fight ahead with the Religious Discrimination Bill. The government has just announced this week that it plans to uh, introduce this bill by December. It's been a long time coming. But of course, it's important for everyone to get involved. If you want to get involved, if you want to help out, you can donate to Equality Australia and Sydney Mardi Gras. You can sign the Freedom From Discrimination petition at the Equality Australia website. And um, we're telling you more about this at the end of this session. Today, we will be hearing some real life stories. And so some of the content could be confronting. If you're affected by any of this, if you'd like help, with your own situation, we do encourage you to reach out. You can go to QLife for mental health support or Equality Australia for legal advice or support. So just to bring us up to date on where we are right now, a bit of background. When marriage equality was passed back in 2017, some of you will probably remember that the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, agreed to send the issue of religious freedom to a review chaired by Philip Ruddock. 
Among the recommendations in the Ruddock Review were the introducing federal religious discrimination protections, like we already have on race and sex, and removing carve-outs that allowed LGBTQ plus students to be expelled from religious schools. The recommendations were leaked during the Wentworth by-election in 2018, that's the one where Karen Phelps was elected. During that by-election, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, committed to removing the carve-outs so no student could be expelled from a religious school on the basis of their sexuality. The government went to the last general election too with that commitment to introduce a federal law to protect people from discrimination on the basis of their religious belief. So here we are in 2021. The Prime Minister's commitment to repealing the carve-outs that allow students to be expelled from religious schools hasn't gone anywhere so far, so that still is there. It's able to happen, and I'm sure it is happening. Teachers too, as you'll hear today from Karen Pack's story, have little protection in our national laws and the laws of this state as they currently stand. Instead, the issue of these religious carve-outs have been referred to an Australian Law Reform Commission inquiry, and that's contingent on the passage of the federal government's religious discrimination bill. So where is that bill that was promised way back in 2018? Well, it's already had two rewrites and it's been described as friendless by some. It has some troubling elements within it, including provisions that deal with doctors and other health professionals being able to refuse healthcare on the basis of their religious beliefs. Think about that. We're going to hear, we'll be talking more about that today. And it removes discrimination protections in employment, education and service settings when people say offensive things based on their religious beliefs. I think that's regarded by many as the Israel Folau clause. Today, you're going to hear from people who are and have been central in the LGBTQI plus movement on these issues. Coming up on our panel today, we'll be joined by Karen Pack. She's an ordained minister and leadership trainer, marketing uh, ordained minister and leadership trainer. We're also going to be here joined by Hussein Hawley, who's a marketing professional and LGBTQI plus community advocate. Um, um, also, Ghassan Kassasia is the Equality Australia Legal Director and Joe Inkpen, who is Australia's first transgender, transgender priest. We had been planning to also have Karen Phelps, Dr. Karen Phelps, on our panel today, but given the COVID situation as it's emerging here in Sydney right now, and the fact that Karen has a GP's practice in eastern suburbs of Sydney, she really can't come to large gatherings at the moment and for a while. She's very sorry. She sends her apologies. She had really, really wanted to be here. So enough from me. Let's kick off proceedings with a first-hand account of religious discrimination in our schools. Could you please welcome Karen Pack to the stage? And after Karen, we'll be hearing from Hussein Hawley. Thank you. Thanks, Ren. Hey, everybody. My name is Karen. I live on Barramatagal land. I am a pastor with a couple of other people of a little church that we say is for spiritual refugees, people that have been kicked out or made unwelcome of a whole bunch of places. Uh, I'm also a leadership trainer and a religious historian, currently doing a PhD at Macquarie University, looking at why religious histories have ignored unmarried women, uh, marginalised and excluded them from the accounts of our history in Australia, uh, with implications for LGBT people as well. Basically, anyone who's not heteronormative hasn't made it into a religious history in Australia to date. That's what I'm looking at. Uh, most recently, I was a lecturer at a place called Morling College, which is the major Baptist theological college here in Sydney. And I was uh, training chaplains and counsellors to work in multi-faith, multicultural contexts. Uh, pretty much everyone I worked with, all my faculty, everyone I reported to knew that I was gay. But I'm also really good at what I do. I know as a woman I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, but I'm really good at what I do. And so even though I was gay uh, and they knew that, they loved the work that I was doing. And so I was teaching core subjects like theological foundations and ethics. I was teaching sexual ethics to Christian counsellors uh, and chaplains. Now, most people, when they get engaged, they might expect to be congratulated by their workmates, yeah? maybe a cake at morning tea. I mean, I'm not expecting unicorns and glitter, but you know. Uh, but for me, when I got engaged, I got fired. 
So at the end of 2019, when uh, I came back from holidays and told my colleagues at work that Bronte and I had got engaged on a beach in Fiji, um, the, the words sort of started to filter out into the wider Christian evangelical community. And the college where I was working started to get phone calls and emails uh, describing me, my sexuality, my relationship with my wife as evil and demonic and needing to be denounced publicly by the college. And so the college obviously didn't defend me, they fired me. Now you folks know that growing up gay in a religious context is not easy. And in fact, for me, it was terrifying the thought of coming out in that context. And yet the Christian context and the evangelical context is all that I'd ever known. And my whole career existed within that very context. Uh, And so, but I knew that if I ever came out, I would be ostracized by my community. It might be like soft exclusion, like you're not allowed to lead the singing anymore, or you're not allowed to preach anymore, you're not allowed to welcome people at the door, or you're not allowed to work with kids anymore because you know all gays are obviously pedophiles. Um, I knew that that would happen. I knew that I could be kicked out of community. And so from the time when I was a teenager, when I first had people try to you know, pray away the gay and, and uh, exercise the demons of sexual immorality, I just became deeply closeted to myself, let alone everyone else. And I could never admit to myself that I was gay. And so, you know, my journal as a teenager is filled with me saying, God, I'm sick, you need to help me, all that kind of stuff. Uh, And I was depressed and suicidal for many, many years. Until I fell in love with Bronte. And then I couldn't deny it anymore. And I didn't want to deny it anymore that I was gay. And I've got to be honest with you, most of the things that I was afraid of happening, they did happen. Uh, I've been called demonic coming into churches. I obviously was uh, fired from my job. My wife has had people very close to her take her out for coffee to explain to her that she's possessed by the devil and needs to fight it every day. That stuff really does happen. But here's the thing that most people don't know. For me, coming out also means finding community. It means being embraced by people who see me authentically for who I really am and love me exactly as I am, and that is what I've found. You know, um, for me, I've been taught my whole life that you're either gay and Christian, you can't be both, the two are incompatible. And there's you know, a lot of people who wanna say um, that you know, Jesus will reject you, the church will reject you. But more and more, there's this chorus of voices, this chorus of inclusion that understands that there is no way in which Jesus Christ excludes or condemns people who are same-sex attracted or gender diverse. That's just not a biblical reality. And so today, my mission in life is to say to young people of faith in particular, young queer people of faith, that you are loved exactly as you are. And you do not have to choose between your faith and your sexuality. And there are places where you can find acceptance and love exactly as you are. And voices that are telling you anything else need to be called out for what they are. Voices that are trying to conduct a purge of the church, kicking out people from within the ranks, not closing the doors on people outside. And they need to be called out as abusive and unchristian. And I'm hoping that together we can make a change and that you guys will help me with that. I'm gonna ask Huss to come out and share his story. Hi everyone, I promised myself I wouldn't cry today. Um, Every time I do this, it brings like a lot of memories, but um, I promised myself that I need to stand up for the queer Muslim community. Um, So my story, he started in, um, really started in 2007 when I came out. I was 16 at the time. So I am gay, Lebanese, and Muslim. Um, born and raised in Sydney's western suburbs. I have five older sisters. My parents um, immigrated to Australia from Lebanon in the 70s to escape the civil war and um, obviously provide the best possible life for their children. Um, I... In 2007, I was, you know, on, online, exploring my sexuality, trying to chat to people, trying to um, really understand what 
who I was. Um, I, I say that I accidentally came out to my father. He thought I was um, on drugs because I was shivering one night, having an anxiety attack. Um, but I actually had an issue with a man I was seeing at the time. And um, he said, to, my father said to me, please tell me, what is it? Is it drugs? I'll help you, I'll help you. And then that night, um, sorry, that morning, I said to him, no, dad, I'm gay. Um, my dad isn't a religious person. He's more culturally influenced, but um, he, you know, those two things coincide. My family generally is very religious. Um, he stopped talking to me that day. For a period of three to four years, I was physically abused by my father um, and my brother-in-laws. Um, they tried to beat the gay out of me. They used the religion to justify their actions and didn't see that as a bad thing. Um, they physically harmed me with a belt on multiple occasions. They slammed my head on the floor, on the concrete floor, on the tiled floor, multiple times to beat the gay out of me. They put my hand on the door hinge and shut the door multiple times. They really tried to hurt me. Um, that happened, despite the fact that, uh, that all that happening, I was so insular and I didn't know better at the time. So I, despite the fact it was a very unsafe environment, I stayed there powerless, not knowing what to do. I didn't even think, even though the internet was booming at the time, I didn't even think of looking online because I was so terrified. Um, and they always said to me, I was sick, I was sick, and I was sick. Um, at the time, despite the fact that I was going through so much trauma, so much pain, I turned to my GP, who is still a practicing GP in Harris Park out west, he is a uh, Lebanese and Christian, and he said to me, and I told him, you know, I thought I'd get some support from him. I said to him, um, you know, I'm gay, you know, that whole narrative. And he looked at me in disgust and said to me, being gay is like putting, and sorry, please excuse me for using the language, but he said, um, true, word for word, being gay is like putting a penis into a pile of shit. So I'm getting physically assaulted at home, getting this from my GP. My family um, then made me drop out of school from Chester High School, pushed me into Grand Boys High School thinking that an all-boys school would straighten me up, but I actually had more gay experience. Uh, you know, and I'm telling you, honestly, I had a few guys try to kiss me and they're really successful out west and they're all Muslim and everything, um, living double lives. Well, I don't even know what kind of lives they live. Anyway, that's a whole different narrative. Um, but I was forced to go to Granville's High School, repeat, um, and um, they tried to push me to see a psychologist, a, Muslim, a prominent Muslim psychologist who is a practicing psychologist um, out west in Bankstown, um, who um, tried to, back at the time, convert me um, to the straight path, just like the rest of the brothers of Islam. Wow, right? <laughs> you know, these people are still practicing. Um, and it was only until recently that, I, I, at the time, despite the fact there was so much pain, and I, I, I tried to take my own life multiple times, but there's always something in me that said to me, Allah doesn't want this to happen to me. Allah doesn't want me to commit suicide. My life is worth living. Something always stopped me in those moments. I then promised myself that I'll always stand up and use my voice to protect people like me, um, you know, queer and Muslim, because there is so much pain and suffering happening out there, and I feel responsible for standing up and speaking up, despite the fact that I do cop a lot of, um, sl you know, a lot, of, a lot of online bullying just for protecting our community. But we all have that responsibility to let our live our best, true lives and stand up for what is right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen and Hussein, for sharing your stories. Such traumatic stories, really, and I think a surprise for many of us um, that are operating in our comfortably in our little niches in the worlds we create, and you know, not stepping out too far, and to be reminded that, as you say, Hus, these these people are still practicing. The yeah. GPs, the psychologists, Karen, this is still very much an, an operating world for many, yeah. many, many Australians. Yeah. Um, were 
you surprised? I mean, obviously you were surprised, Karen, when you shared your good news about you and Bronte and the response you got. When marriage equality passed in 2017, did you think the world would be different? Did you, you know, you talked about the chorus of inclusion. Mm. Did you hear that chorus in the wake of, because I thought I did in the wake of marriage equality bill, um, did you feel like it was a safe place? Is that, is that what led you to be so open in the first place? No, I think what led me to be open is my relationship with Bronte, wanting to enjoy that fully and not to be closeted anymore, but also becoming more and more aware of the number of young queer people of faith in particular, and older people as well, that were just suffering so much um, for their, because of their faith and their sexuality and the perceived incompatib incompatibility. And so wanting to, in some way, be a voice to say, hey, you are not alone, there are other people like us out there. Um, and so I think what has surprised me is, I mean, we've, we've got some pretty, had some pretty atrocious things said and done to us over the years. Um, I had an experience with a psychologist who was a Christian who said an interesting thing to me. Um, but what I've been surprised at and encouraged by is the number of straight allies from within faith communities who have actually voiced their support. And it's that kind of quiet ripple that I want to see become more of a tidal wave. And I wonder, I mean, we'll talk today, I suppose, about how we do that, but in terms of your own, you know, you lost your job at Morling, yeah. Morling College, was it? Yeah, that's Morling. right. So where do you work now? Have you, have yeah. you been employable? Um, am I employable? That's an excellent question. I'm not, I'm not currently in, uh, employed permanently because um, I was actually a tenured, like, permanent faculty there. Um, so at the moment, I'm working full-time on my PhD and doing some contracting work. So, so I it's an ongoing price you pay. Oh, 100%. I lost my whole career, 100%. Since you've, Huss, I'll come to you in a minute, but since you've told your story publicly, which you have in places like this, but also on 7.30, um, have people been coming to you with similar stories? Mm. How common is this kind of discrimination in a pretty mainstream, what I would have thought a mainstream religious yeah. world? Yeah, it's incredibly common. From the time that I started to be more vocal um, on socials, like Facebook and Insta and stuff like that, um, at least one person per week coming out to me for the last a couple of years now, um, at least one person per week contacting me online and coming out to me, um, wrestling with their sexuality and their faith. Um, often it will be students that I used to teach. Um, it can be teachers in Christian schools or Bible colleges like Morning, even some people from overseas. I've had people from uh, the Middle East and places where I used to teach overseas, like constantly coming out and sharing the same story. And Hussein, let me ask you that same question. Um, someone part of a a number of minority groups in a sense, you know, gay, yeah. Muslim, Arab. Mm. Have you had people since you've, you know, your profile is relatively high yeah. in this, these communities. Have you had people come to you since you've been public? Yes, a lot. Um, I, I receive, you know, thank God for social. <laughs> um, people reach out one-to-one -one and mostly on Instagram, reach out to me from all across Australia mm. um, and worldwide as, um, you know, when I've done multiple articles for, you know, interviews with SBS and, um, BB, BBC and all that, um, and people reach out to me asking for support and in complete pain, um, and it breaks my heart, it breaks my heart, but at the same time, I'm just glad that they can reach out to someone like me. Um, there's not many, unfortunately, people like me in the queer Muslim um, minority groups that are willing to speak up. Um, you know, I'm terrified myself, but at the same time, I need to be brave for them and myself, right? I was just going to ask you that. I mean, your, your, the story you told of the physical abuse yeah. was horrific. So I suppose in, in good conscience, when people come to you, what is your advice to speak out and risk the kind of physical mm -hmm. abuse you suffered? Or how, do you, how have you managed that, sorted yeah. that? Well, it's, it's, it's the stuff that I wish I knew at the time. So at the time, I wish I reached out to authorities, to network support groups, to, you know, Lifeline, to the police, um, you know, if required, if people are comfortable, of course, but, like, to reach out to relevant networks, professional networks, to get support um, is my advice to them because at the time, I didn't do that because I didn't know what to do because you're so carried away in so much pain. Yeah. You're, are you safe now in your family? Group? Yes, yes. Well, thankfully, you know, um, you know, I'm in a happy five-year relationship with my partner Richard and two amazing dogs, and you know, my life has completely flipped. But I mean, if you go home to the brothers-in-law, well, it's funny. Um, it's I, I, my parents still live out west. Um, I speak to my father now, um, but. It's kind of like I have two polar opposite lives. I'm living this dichotomy life where um, I go there 
don't ask, don't tell policy applies. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of in myself, but I kind of not. I don't speak about my part. I don't speak about the amazing things happening in my life because I can't bring up that whole notion of being gay. Yeah. And so still to this very day, despite the fact that, you know, I have evolved as a person and I'm in an incredibly happy place, I still live two different lives yeah. okay. now, and I have to navigate every we're day. We're almost out of time for this part, but Karen, yeah. I want to ask you that same question, given mm. what's happened to you. When those people come to you at least once a week or, or more, yeah. what's your advice? My advice is to create a safety net first before you come out to, to family and religious context. Um, so you can reach out to places like Quality Australia, Equal Voices, mm. which is a faith network. Um, you can come to our church if you're a Christian. Um, but to find a, cre and create a community of people that are supportive mm. and that have your back, because unfortunately it is likely to be awful when you do come out to your faith community and you need people that have your back and that remind you, you start loved, you don't have to earn that, you start loved exactly as you are. And mm -hmm. just briefly to both of you, because I think this is where we need to head, using the stories, both your stories we've heard today as teachable moments, mm. how can we communicate the impact of discrimination and achieve change and greater acceptance for LGBTQI plus people, including within faith groups. I mean, as I listened to Hussain's story of that physical abuse, I was imagining that, and perhaps naively, that a lot of people in, people of faith would hearing that would be shocked and appalled yeah. and disapproving. Mm. But how, how, can we, how can we use these stories to change? Yeah. Mm. Well, from my experience, especially in the Muslim community, it all starts from um, community leaders. So imams, um, you know, pe people, even like the psychologist that I saw, she has a very influential voice. So speaking to those people, you know, making change with prominent figures within the community, which changed the dialogue for parents, and it would change my dialogue for my parents, mm. um, but educating them and getting them on board. And do you think that's happening with that? with that psychologist, with the she's, imams? She's changed her narrative. She actually reached out to me two years ago. Wow, um, great. So she's changed her narrative and realised what she did was wrong, um, which was amazing. But oh. sometimes there is change with these people and sometimes there isn't mm. because, you know, Islam is just mm. a slow-moving religion. Mm. And I would, I would actually say the opposite for my context, just mm. that our religious leaders and faith leaders are completely ignoring people that are telling their stories. So what we need is people in churches and in faith communities and institutions having the courage to tell their stories so that people realise there is a groundswell of people and having straight allies that are afraid to come out as allies, having them have the courage to stand up and support us. Mm. That's what need is. it needs to be a groundswell for us. Okay, well look, Karen and Hussain, thank you so much for sharing your sure. stories. You. Let's now invite the other panellists to join us. Gassan Kassasia is the Legal Director at Equality Australia. Uh, he knows the ins and outs of the federal discrimination laws as they are drafted and stand now and likely to change. And Joe Inkpen, Australia's first transgender priest, a minister in the Uniting Church. Could you please welcome both Hassan and Joe? <laughs> Kassan, let's go to you first because you're the legal eagle here in terms of us trying to understand <laughs> what is in these bills, uh, in this bill. Um, but before we do, I think we should all watch this video. A bill has been drafted that threatens to divide our communities. The Religious Discrimination Bill will give people a license to discriminate. The bill would mean we're less protected under the law. It will leave us all vulnerable. What constitutes discrimination today will be considered okay tomorrow. It will take away your rights at work, at school and in hospitals when people say offensive things. Things like... My waiter telling me that my relationship is an abomination in God's eyes. My support worker telling me that disability is caused by the devil. It's not okay for a manager to tell us that we are oppressed by our faith because we are women. This bill could see some of the most vulnerable in our communities encounter judgment in closed doors when they most need our compassion and support. It's not okay for my nurse to tell me that HIV is a punishment from God. It's not okay for a teacher to tell either of my daughters that my ex-wife and I are still married in God's eyes. This bill will divide our communities. It will take us backwards. It will affect us all. Our laws should protect all of us equally. Equally. 
Equally. Equally. Equally. And this bill threatens that. We need your voice. And that's why we're here today, because we are going to need a lot of loud, informed voices. And so I think in that light, Kassan, let me ask you, yes, it's not okay. Um, this bill, the bill they're referring to there in the video, is in fact the old bill that was put forward, a draft bill put forward by the former Attorney General Christian Porter. Um, we also know there is a proposal from One Nation's Mark Latham here in New South Wales for a similar law. Um, there's a new bill. We now know we've got a new Attorney General and Michaela Cash has announced this week that by December she will bring forward a new draft bill. We're not yet to see it. But, Kassan, can you tell us a little bit about the religious discrimination reforms as we know them, where they are, where they're up to, what they're up to? So the, the federal one we're expecting before December, the, the final version of the dra uh, draft bill to be introduced. And in New South Wales, we um, have a proposal from One Nation where the Attorney General in New South Wales is considering his response to a report that was um, issued by the upper house of the um, New South Wales Parliament by September this year. Um, but to the two issues, I think, in the federal bill, so the, the video speaks to one of those issues, which is the statement of belief provisions, which remove existing protections that exist on every ground, race, religion, in, in state and territory laws, age, disability, and sexual orientation, gender identity, and where they exist, um, uh, sex characteristics or intersex protections. And it says that when you are in an employment setting, or uh, receiving education or receiving goods and services, if someone says something based on their religious beliefs or about religion, that cannot constitute discrimination. If it's offensive and it can't harass you or it can't humiliate you, um, but it can certainly offend you. And in the way that you heard um, doctors, for example, saying that in the context of a patient consultation or a teacher saying that to a student, the other significant part is around healthcare and allowing uh, a group of health professionals, including psychologists, pharmacists and doctors, to refuse treatment to people based on religious beliefs, even when it would adversely impact the health of their patients. Give us an example of how, what that might look like, can you? So going to a doctor and asking for a prescription to prep or the morning after pill and being told, I'm sorry, I don't believe in marriage, uh, sex outside of marriage and I don't offer that service or going to the doctor and saying, I'd like a vaccination, and being told, I don't prescribe vaccinations because uh, the research uses aborted fetuses, wow. those sorts of ideas. And so uh, at your GP, for example, saying, my, my religious beliefs override your right to access to healthcare. And that's illegal now? Well, the professional codes would say you have to disclose that you have an objection, you have to provide some kind of continuity of care for your patient, and you cannot refuse services in emergencies. So these laws, the, the problem is they don't have those sorts of protections and safeguards for patients. So patients will become more vulnerable and won't necessarily know um, when they show up to um, an emergency or uh, to see a doctor or a psychologist that uh, these views are impacting the way that healthcare is being delivered to them. And just in terms of the first part of the bill, which I referred to in my introduction as sort of the Israel Folau clause. Um, I noticed that Janet Rice from the Greens described this bill as she sees it emerging under the hands of the new Attorney General as a Trojan horse of hate. Just be a little, give us an example, will you, of what it would do, how it would change the workplace in terms of what people might be able to say and do without any kind of comeback from not just the person who's offended, but the employer. So it ties the hands of the employer because they've got two conflicting obligations. Mm. One is to the uh, employee that may be a woman, may be a person with disability, a minority faith, um, or a gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, intersex person who receives these kinds of messages casually, you know, mm. darted around. And I think we all experience them in various ways during the marriage equality postal survey. So imagine just having a casual conversation talked about your relationships as being sinful or unacceptable or disgusting just because someone believes that and they get to define what they believe as well. And so that's the difficulty is really any religious belief 
or a belief about religion, so we can start insulting each other's beliefs or lack thereof, um, become immunised in those sort of casual ways, which may not mean, um, you know, vilification or violence or anything like that, but it's that casual banter in the office that suddenly tells someone, actually, oh, I'm not so comfortable with your relationship because you're in a same-sex relationship, or I really think that your uh, child would be better off with a mother and a father those sorts of things, in a workplace setting, or your doctor saying that to you, or your teacher saying that to you, because that's what discrimination law actually does. The, the, those who would propose, and Joe, I might bring you in on this as well, Kassan and, Kassan and then Joe, um, those who would propose this change or this protection would feel like, well, I've got a right to my opinion. I feel this, I should be able to say it without being vulnerable to a legal challenge. Um, is that fair enough too? I mean, we, how much... Wriggle room is there, I suppose, before we start getting laws around what people can say and, and voice their opinions. Well, it's quite ironic, really, because churches every so often in the past have gone on about um, resistance to rights and talked about responsibilities. So, and it's the other side of those things, whether your rights to, you may have a right, you can believe whatever you like, but it's your responsibility to others. And so this, for me, goes to the, to be honest, it goes to the core. What I think is happening is we, this is just one aspect of, of a big struggle that's actually happening, um, if you like, a struggle about the nature of spirituality in the modern world. And what's happened is that a lot of the religious people have got panicky, they see the world changing, and instead of engaging with it, they're withdrawing mm. in order to protect themselves. It won't help them in the long run, and what happens is they start to behave badly towards other people. Mm. So the answer really, from a religious point of view, to, to that question is, well, in order to do this, you have to chuck out so much that's important, like compassion, for a Christian point of view, loving your neighbour. That mm. is the basic, basic line of mm. Christian faith. So if it means that you're going around sacking people, excluding kids mm. from school, how is that love of neighbour? It isn't. Mm. Uh, but it's because religion has become something about belief rather than something much bigger than mm. that, which is to do with experience, practice a whole lot of mores and relationships. So there's a struggle within our society at the moment by certain, within religion, for some groups to, to enhance their power because they see it lost in society. And so the rest of us, who are also religious, lots of us, mm. um, are being crushed in the middle of it. So you have to say, what about, what about their rights? What's about my rights? So when you say there's a person? struggle within, yeah. how outspoken is that? How obvious and present is that struggle and how do those within and who have some authority positions within the, the churches justify the love thy neighbour versus allowing, you know, offensive if not slash hate speech? Well, I think that's the question we have to put to people. I mean, the reason is that's people like those of us who are here, people of faith, we're here now, you know, and I am a minister in, right in the centre of Sydney which denies, Sydney is one of the worst religious cultures, it's not as bad in some other places, that, that it denies that we actually exist mm. and that we can do things, we clearly can. So it's, it's really back to what, a little bit I think what Karen was saying before, the visibility of people of yeah. faith will, calls the bluff on this sort of idea that we don't exist at all or that we're marginal. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the Latham Bills and other things and Michaela mm. Cash, did they, have they been talking to people like me or Karen? No, they haven't. They speak to the same small group. Yeah. So there's who don't represent here. us mm -hmm. and don't that's represent right. the broader faith at well, all. Well, mm -hmm. given that's true now, now that it is being put on the agenda, uh, let me ask any of you really. But Karen, start with you. Do you think this presents an opportunity to bring in? I mean, the the key to the successful pl um, plebiscite, I think, was that the message to um, supporters of the same sex change to talk to your families, talk to your yeah. friends, go out and make it a human to human contact. That was the, that was the pathway to success. Yeah. Um, for some, they paid a price for that, but nevertheless. I mean, it, does having the bill on the table, do you think it presents an opportunity or am I just being Pollyanna? No, I, I think it does because I think places like 
Malling College and other Christian religious institutions, other relig religious institutions, are really scrambling to protect their right to discriminate. And they're telling a lie. They're saying, we are protecting our faith from those people out there who oppose us, those people out there who want to water down our faith. Now, that is a lie, because what's actually happening is a purge of the church, kicking people out of these places of faith. And so we have an opportunity to call BS and say, that's just, that's just not true. Like, hello, we're here, we exist. Um, and for people, allies in those communities of faith to put their hands up and go, you don't represent me. Because at the moment, we've got people in churches and faith-based institutions who are terrified as, of coming out as allies because of the cost to them. And we have an opportunity to, as the debate happens, to raise our visibility and go, no, 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 no. We're right here and we are people of faith and you can't kick us out because you're not the ones who got the choice to accept us and love us in the first place. And so we have a choice, an opportunity to tell those stories. Joe, do you see it as an opportunity? Yes, I mean, I, I, when I worked in Toowoomba, it was quite interesting. Sometimes I'd talk to some of the most, concerned, you know, it's sort of the Shel Lyle Shelton world, and um, in parts of it, but it's changed. Toowoomba is an interesting thing because, again, the queer community isn't so visible. It's becoming slightly more visible, but the more visibility you get, mm. the more courage and strength. It's the same yes. thing but for people of faith haven't had that. But I used to talk to some of these, one or two, not all, some conservative Christian leaders, and they would say to me privately, but I actually, I don't, re actually, I'm quite happy with marriage equality, but I couldn't say that in my church, or I would lose my job like mm. Karen or everything else. But then the next day I'd talk to somebody from this, from this person's church, yeah. and they'd say, Actually, I don't agree with this, but because the pastor agrees with this, yeah. I'm going along with this. Yeah, that's so right. there's this collusion because yeah. the truth is not people being told. Concerned. And it is mm. about people, it's about speak. Ultimately, it's about love and relationships. That's the mm. core bit where the, I mean, the churches and, and other faiths have succeeded to survive over 2,000 years or more in the case of Judaism and Buddhism because they are, um, because they change. Yeah. And this is a huge change, mm. but it's been done before, and they have yeah. to do that or they will die. So, Hussain, what about you? Do you see it as an, as an opportunity, to, or do you see it as a danger time that mm. it will unleash? Yeah, well, I, I feel like if this does get passed, it, it will make things so much more worse. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people like me that lived with, you know, you're not only living with, you know, being queer, but you're living with, there's discrimination happening on all levels, like being, you know, when the Cronulla riots happened, you know, you're living with that, you're living with discrimination on your cultural level, your religious level, your sexuality. Um, and even with the support that I have got received over the years, it's always like, oh yeah, I support you, but I don't want anyone else to know. Mm -hmm. um, and that still to this very day is treated like that. Um, people within the community um, have, I haven't received much support from the, the Muslim community, the anything, even family and friends, are all, it's such a patriarchal society with Islam um, that they all turn to these religious leaders are all like, no, being queer is this. Um, and it's just going to, if you're giving the rights to discriminate even further, then it's just going to get worse. There's not an upside in having a discussion nationally that allows it to be framed in the frame of fairness. I, no. I was just going to say, like, I think as that discussion happens, the stories of more and more people come out as well. You know, like, I w it was just last year that I was fired. Um, this year, two of my friends who are teachers at Christian schools were fired. Um, I'm just gonna say it. Last week, Hillsong College kicked out two students for being gay. Mm. There are people in this room who went through hell in their Christian schools for being gay. Mm -hmm. If people hear those stories, all the people that go, oh, but that doesn't happen, that doesn't still happen, well... Mm. Well, that's a really mm -hmm. good point, isn't it? And because... Um, perhaps, again, naively, I'm painting myself as a real Pollyanna in this discussion, but um, <laughs> when the Ruddick Review came out, the reforms, Gassan, it included getting rid of those carve-outs for the religious schools to get rid of, mm. to, you know, kick out gay kids or, you know, kids mm. that had an issue with their gender identity, whatever it is. Um, and I saw that as a positive. I thought that was a positive. Scott Morrison really was, you know, during the Wentworth by-election, backed into supporting that. It was an election commitment it hasn't happened. But from what Karen's saying, that would be a positive that would stop something happening that is happening now. So <laughs> I, I think um, you're, you're right to be optimistic in that 
when that issue arose, everyone was shocked that it could happen. And it's like, we've been telling you for 20 years yeah. that but these exemptions But the church leaders happen. I interviewed said, it doesn't happen. Yeah, and Tell me where it happens, Fran. I interviewed them. Tell me where it's happened. And, you know, I need Come to... Come and talk get, to us. I need yeah. to gather Come some to our examples. church and talk to every person there. So, yeah. so what I think what happened post-marriage equality was um, the most vulnerable in our communities to to exclusion and discrimination became even more vulnerable to it. And we've heard that today, but in our office, when we get calls, it's people really, trans people, yeah. people of faith, people from um, multicultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds who are still on the front lines of these wars that other people are fighting um, against us. And the law is only one part of it, but the debates that are happening really silence a lot of these voices. Yes. And actually, what we saw with marriage equality was a massive divide in mm. our communities. And people in certain no voting electorates, you know, um, are still at the front line of, of this fight. I mean, it's incredible mm -hmm. to have basically two openly gay Arab men on a stage talking mm. openly mm. about yes. their sexuality. I've yeah. been doing this a little long, <laughs> long time, and for a long time I felt like I was the only one. Mm. And more and more um, I hear people like Huss and others speaking out, but at great personal cost. Yes. And yeah. some of those electorates that voted no are electorates with, dominated by um, Arab and Muslim populations. Mm. In your experience, has anything changed since the vote? Mm. Does the stamp yes. of a law? Yes, because I don't think they're the ones fighting against us. I actually think they're being co-opted yes. by powerful Leaders. people, right. often not from our communities, who say, there's something for you to be scared of. Mm. Yeah. Often not from, your, not from the Muslim faith. Absolutely not. These, these laws actually impact Muslim people just as much as they impact gay and lesbian people because part, part of the, yep. the law is to say that you mustn't discriminate on the basis of religion unless you're a religious institution so that mm. 100 Catholic right. schools can refuse that one Muslim kid in the same way that they can refuse the gay kid. Yeah. Um, it, so there's actually plenty of room for allyship here um, and building bridges with these communities that are, first of all, not really um, uh, engaged in these debates in a fair way because they're not explained. Actually, this is the impact of the law. Yeah. I mean, I speak to um, people who are Jewish, who work in um, large Catholic hospitals or Catholic universities and those sorts of institutions, who also feel afraid about talking about their beliefs mm. as Jewish people um, or as Muslims or, or whoever, they experience the same fear yeah. that the gay teacher does in a Catholic mm -hmm. school who has to keep closeted for fear of, of coming out. So there's plenty of um, ground there for us to, to find commonality. but. Hussain, do you, do you mm. share that view? Yes, yes. Um, you know, just going back to 2017, it was such a horrible period for me. You know, going out west, and mm. um, this is what I wanted to mention earlier on, is, um, you know, going out west and just constantly hearing that you're, you know, it was just the comments that were thrown in my family environment, and I'm just sitting there thinking, do I pick my battles, do I... Do, you know, do you, do you say something, do you not? Because you know if you do say something, it's just going to end up in a war. Yeah. Um, and it did happen a couple of times. Um, but, yeah, I think the, from then to now, um, you know, my family, the people that I know, it's like I always laugh about going out west. It's like taking your passport, you're entering a whole new country, um, <laughs> it, it, whole new views. And it, it does feel that way. I, I drive out to see them and I still feel like they all still have the same view, but the rest of the world is moving. Mm -hmm. And they're not seeing that because they're surrounded by the same people and I the same communities. I think also, I mean, Australia is changing. The census, census will tell us oh. that yeah, I think right. the majority is not Christian now. I'm, I'm not quite no clear religion. on the, the no, religion. no religion. So I think some people feel that to express any religious view, they invite disapproval. And that's not about being gay or being trans or it's about having a belief. So I think there's that coming up against at the time of this bill and the two are being... That's been co-opted in a sense. I think that's what you're saying. Mm. It's dividing people. I mean, the, what's an opportunity actually, I think, for the queer community is for us to make the rainbow um, better or more vibrant. You know, for years, trans people, 
the T was silent in LGBT, so that's changed a bit, a bit more to do. Um, but I think people of faith, um, have a lot of people of faith find, tell me it's harder sometimes to come out in the queer community as a person of faith yeah. than it is <laughs> as a person of... Yeah. So to get, and, and that's an issue. Um, and I think it, what we're inviting, in particular what, what you've said there about the in, that we have to work so much better, more intersec intersectionally, and to, to work with those groups that have been overlooked. And it is people like in the west of Sydney and elsewhere, and not just the same, same people. And therefore, people of faith have got something to offer, I suppose, to, mm -hmm. to the queer community. And that's, our, that's one of our biggest problems, is that, and we were talking backstage about this as well, the, the amount of support that, um, and resources that queer Christians have to, to support others is really minuscule. Mm -hmm. The levels of burnout of leadership, for example, in Equal Voices, that I'm part of, is horrific yeah. because of the strains that are upon us. We just don't get the funds. We're not, we're not taught to. So there is a, there is a challenge, I think, for um, the wider queer community to actually embrace people of faith, particularly people of faith of of more marginal spaces and support that. And so, I, I mean, this is a great sign of hope, to be quite honest, because I don't think a few years ago that a bunch of us would have been, a, you know, people of faith, queer people of faith, would have had the platform um, that Equality Australia and Mardi Gras have given us. You know, Mardi Gras, you know, one of the poster girls this year was my trans priest friend down in Adelaide, Sorrel Cow. It's a sign of change, I think. And, but we have to build on that and continue to make those links. And in doing so, maybe we'll make it more comfortable for straight allies in church communities to stand up with us. Because at the moment, they're sort of like, they're sympathetic, some of them, but they don't know what to do. Mm. And they I haven't got resources it. for I it. I mean, I heard a story recently which shocked me, Pollyanna again, but um, you know, in terms of a, a small community in the country, Anglican parish, small church, um, the two parishioners who are gay, married since the marriage equality bill passed, have been, one of them plays the organ in the church, have been told to not come to church anymore yeah. and said, and been, or basically the word given to them was, you know, we don't want you to get divorced, but you need to live separately. If you live separately, you can come back to church. I mean, I was mm. horrified. Mm -hmm. and, and the people in the parish, many of them were horrified and upset. They know and love these people, but they don't know what to do because the mm. pastor is the pastor and, or the minister is the minister. And I didn't even know that was legal. Is that legal, Hassan? What, effectively, what happens within the four walls of a church is not governed by discrimination law at all. So, um, who, you, who leads you, your practices is all, all outside of, of the law. What the law does is deal with employment, education, the provision of goods and services. So, it's already narrow, and then they add exceptions yeah. to that law. So, were you shocked to hear that, Joe? Because I think the more of these stories that are made public, the better chance you've got we've all got, of more of the allies coming out as well in support. No, I'm not shocked, but yeah. it, it's absurd. See, things, it's that, that's what I said before, it's absurd. You have to twist yourself in where you start mistreating your own people. This is what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, I mean, I've been married for 35 years, but when I came out, questions were then asked about my marriage, my church, and I couldn't get married in an Anglican church in this country. Um, and it, it's that sort of bizarre showing up those contradictions mm -hmm. and, the, and the lack of compassion, um, I think is, is yes at the heart of that. But it is about not giving power, and, and Gus Sun's right, it's about giving power not to institutions, because what's actually happening here, and in this city, in Sydney, the Anglican diocese has got a pretty horrendous policy <laughs> about transgender people. Now, because they've got that policy, they can say, this is the opinion of a religious viewpoint, but it's clearly not, because I disagree with it, but a lot of people in Anglicans in Sydney do. But the de definition is then decided by a small body in one city rather than the nation as a whole. Okay, so in the short time we've got left before we throw to your questions, uh, let's get a, a view from everybody, but starting with you, Gassan, about there is a new bill coming forward, we know that, we don't know what will be in it, but we will see a draft at some point before December. Um, what do we need to watch out for? And, and I suppose for all of us, as, as you know, activists and people with personal experience of discrimination, 
what can, pe what can all of us do to get involved? Go, sir. So I think we need to test it about, uh, test the law as to whether it protects all of us equally. Mm. It's pretty simple. So um, you don't get to sign up um, for protection if you're not willing to give the same protection that you're getting yeah. mm. to someone else. And those double standards are what we should be looking at. How people can get involved, um, I mean, the simplest way is to hop onto our website. They can sign a petition today um, that deals with both the exceptions on, on schools, the Raise Your Hand campaign, as well as the Freedom From Discrimination campaign. And what we will do is keep people updated as we find out more of the details about how they can take further action beyond that. Um, apart from that, donating to the campaign so we can get the word out around the bits of the bill that are real problematic. And also, I mean, I'll be in Canberra on Monday, um, <laughs> COVID restrictions permitting, um, just to see where we can understand which direction this bill is going. But all of that requires all of us um, to kind of chip in in whatever ways that we can. Jose? Yeah, uh, well, I was saying earlier on, um, I've spoken to a few friends and they're like, what is the religious discrimination bill? <laughs> Um, so, from my, uh, my advice is to let people know, speak up, if, even if it's, you know, verbal or, you know, social, but, you know, we all are responsible to let people know what's happening. And um, not just let them know what's happening, but what does this mean for you? And it was only until I was told a couple of my gay mates what it actually means for them, like, oh, crap, um, that they understand the full depth of this. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's really important to understand, tell them what is the impact, and obviously, as Ghassan said, um, you know, reach out, sign petitions, um, you know, Quality Australia's website. Um, yeah, that would be my advice. Joe? Yeah, all of that, and I think it's about um, uh, challenging the people to be, one of the great um, people in America runs a support thing for LGBTI people, um, Susan Cottrell, she speaks to the fact that you can take people round and round and round, but you've got to show, have a vision of something better. Yeah. And I think we cannot be in a position where we're just doing, what they want us to do is to put up our hands and say, this is bad for queer people, or, or some other groups will say, this is bad for us, in that negative way. When we've actually got to say, 60 odd percent of people voted for a different sort of Australia. This is going backwards. How do we work together? So we maybe have to in, um, affirm and uh, religious people that this is not about who becomes a Catholic priest. It is not about how you worship on a Sunday or a Friday or whatever. None of those things are touched at all. Um, you're on our side. This is, this, this, this is wrong. And some of the people who've got it in their heads that they're being threatened, um, it is possible to change some of their view some of their viewpoints, if you can get through the doors yeah. and if you can tell the stories. Okay. Mm. Karen? Yeah, I think for me a lot of it is about telling our stories and about um, people, everyday people in churches, whether they're queer or they're supportive of queer people, having the courage to tell their story and to put up their hand and say, I don't believe that shit. Like, that's just totally contrary to my faith. Um, and to, to be vocal about that. Mm -hmm. Challenging um, pastors and religious ministers that are quietly affirming but terrified of the cost of themselves, mm -hmm. challenging them to come out as allies. Um, the more people are telling their stories and letting people know, no, this is still happening. This is happening every single day. There are kids in Christian schools right now. I have just had a parent last week contact me and say, how do I support my kid who's just come out as gay, um, her, her girlfriend, their parents are pastors, how can I support them? So creating networks as well for people like that, that they have space, safe spaces to come to, um, that they know they've got someone that has their back, that has that same faith, that they're not alone. Okay, well, fantastic. Let's, um, we're gonna open it up for you now. Um, hi, my name is Enrique. Um, I come from a country called El Salvador. Um, when I was in my late teens, um, I went, I went uh, being gay wasn't um, allowed in my religion, in my family, in my culture, so I was put under conversion therapy for a period of two years, um, and then um, that was, had very devastating uh, consequences for my well-being. Um, I got a scholarship to, to leave El Salvador eventually, and I ended up in Australia. Um, when I became a citizen, I felt like I finally had a place I belonged to where I could be Okay, and so this is really relevant to me because 
Um, mm. You know, I didn't come all the way here and have done all, all the amount of sacrifice to have it all yeah. risk again. Yeah. So two quick questions. The first one is, what would you tell new Australians um, that don't know what they don't know? And the second question is, now, now I'm a, a leadership trainer like you, Karen. Yeah. Um, I find that helping people transform, um, it's something that aligns with my purpose, having gotten my experience. And I work for Sydney's most reputable leadership consulting company. We're always looking for people. So would you come for, a, for an interview with us? That's my second question. Thank you. Uh, I feel like Hussein Ogasan should take that first. Yeah. Well, I was a new Australian uh, in, uh, in fact, we all are not yes. the first Australians, but um, I was a new Australian in 1990. And what I would say is, and Hussein and I have slightly different journeys in that, you know, my parents actually, you know, 10 years on, um, postal survey was actually the, the final point in, in our reconciliation. Um, and they're incredibly supportive, but it was a long journey. And I would say to them is, remember why you came which was opportunity. Opportunity, education, healthcare, a place where you put your head on a pillow without a fear around whether you'll wake up the next morning safe. Those are the things that are so precious. And they're precious because there's an opportunity for all of us, no matter who we are, where we come from, what we believe. And if we all can agree on that, we don't actually have to agree on a lot of other things. Um, and that's what I would say. These issues, they're, they're personal to us and they will impact on some of us with our families and those are much more difficult conversations. But at the more general level, it's just remembering actually at the end of the day, there's a lot of us here that came for that opportunity of safety, healthcare, yeah. education, employment. And why would you take it away? Life without fear. Mm. Hussein? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to add on to that. It's, you know, knowing, like, for example, my mum is to provide the resources. My mum only speaks to certain people um, and she gets her information from these certain outlets. So I would provide resources to her. I will educate her on these specific topics. Let her know actually what does it mean, um, as opposed to hearing scare tactics out there and, you know, defaulting on that. So it's to provide resources and um, having those conversations with, um, you know, these people and let them know, actually, this is what it means and it's bad. Um, so that would be my advice on that. Okay. Next question. Yes, I would like to ask about the, uh, the proposed federal bill. There's a clause in it that it becomes illegal to uh, have religious discrimination. It's only illegal if it, has a, if it is a criminal offence that carries more than two years imprisonment. So that is nearly manslaughter. And I wonder how we get around, have you got any idea Kassan? that that awful clause, it, it's quite bizarre. Um, it protects people uh, who have religious beliefs or engage in religious activity which isn't unlawful. Um, so it does actually protect people broadly, but then it takes away those protections in certain instances um, for others and also says that there's exemptions for religious institutions in how they manage, you know, employment or provision of services. So it, it doesn't necessarily rely on any sort of criminal requirements or anything like so, that. So, Gassan, it's not legal for someone to behave criminally to somebody else? No. The, the, it won't say, for example, if you break the law criminally, so if you murdered someone and it was motivated by religious belief, somebody. or assaulted someone based on religious beliefs, that would still be an assault. It doesn't remove the criminal law. But it does say if you employ someone or you provide education or you provide goods and services in a way which discriminates against them through the terms that you do that or the things that you say to them that demeans them, then that could be legal if it's done on the basis of a religious belief. So as I understand it, under the law, if, if it matches your religious belief to be offensive to somebody, that would be legal. If it matches, if it's matches your religious belief to harass somebody, that would not be. But there's the yes. definition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the easiest way to understand is it's like a defence. It's like a free pass if you've got a certain... Um, you know, bad behaviour based on a religious belief than if you just have bad behaviour motivated by nothing else. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next. 
Hi, my name's Sally. Um, gay and Catholic, coming out there on that. Um, <laughs> it's like um, gay, isn't it? Yeah. Hi, my bit, name's Sally. Bit. I'm gay and Catholic. Yep. Um, I really love the discussion, um, Karen and, and um, Hassan, talking about you know whether it needs to come from the straight allies or whether the imams and priests and stuff. I was very lucky that I... Uh, when I came out last year, um, I had a priest who I could chat to and I knew just from little things that have yeah. been in his sermons and stuff that I could chat to him and mm. it wasn't going to completely end my ability to enter the church. Um, I have a lot more freedom than that priest to speak yeah. like that and we had a really beautiful example recently. I think it was Bishop Vincent Long um, who came out and his whole paramount matter... Yeah, that was cool. But uh, being a member both of the Facebook group for Sydney Catholics and one for progressive Catholics, um, which is more a global one, when that came out and he made that, well, the whole diocese made that submission and said that the schools need to include discussions and that's important yeah. for their students, the body of Catholics who opposed that were really well mobilised to shut yeah. that down and, he, and that was... Um, reverse that submission was retracted. Is there a? I feel like because we are so niche Christians or, or Muslims or people of queer people of faith, do we have that same capacity to mobilise and be equally as strong on those issues? Um, being that minority, is there a community development opportunity there for us to be mm. a lot better and a lot quicker at responding? That yeah. Okay. Joe, you had a good example with um, Toowoomba as well. Was there anything you? That's right. Well, I guess that? that's what Equality Australia is doing in a big picture, but yeah. Joe, you want to Well, we have to have stronger networks, you know, and there's fantastic people in the city. Anthony Ben Brown's been at it for a long while, Benjamin O, Catholics. Um, you know, and uniting a network, all of those sorts of things, equal, equal, um, equal voices, and particularly, I think, the fantastic work that the Brave Network in Melbourne has done and, and Chris Subs and others in this city around issues of conversion therapy and orientation change. But it's very, very hard work. And if you speak to any of those people, they'll say the same thing. It is extremely difficult. So actually, I think people of faith need the support of the wider... I mean, queer people of faith need the support of, um, uh, you know, the wider movement to help us. I think we can do it. But it is when people like yourself stand up and say things because you're dead right, a lot of priests, gay priests in the Anglican Church, for example, it's very, very difficult for them to speak out themselves. But lay people can do it. Similarly, and we've got to support people like Bishop Long mm. when, when he's there, because if we lose those voices, mm. we, we're far off. And so let's identify some more. You know, our moderator in the United Church has been good, but he could do more. You know, we've got mm. to keep encouraging them, saying, that's good what you've done. What's the next step? Yeah, so it's about, it is mm. about community development and, and somehow giving people the tools to mobilise within their own communities. Mm -hmm. And that's what a campaign mm -hmm. is. And this is what we're trying to kick off, mm -hmm. get I going. I think there's two really important things. One is we've got the power of our stories. And that's yeah. actually mm -hmm. what's taken us where we've got to. Because um, the, the benefit of LGBTI people is we're kind of everywhere. And we're in almost every family. And so <laughs> we have one clear benefit, is that most people know us as who we are, and mm. so that conversation can really make a big difference. So yeah. the power of our stories, and in, in the most, you know, you don't have to come out publicly like Karen or Haas. You can write to your local member. Yeah. You can have a call with your local member, and those are really important conversations. And the second thing is, the, I mean, the Australian Christian Lobby can raise $2 million in two days for Israel Folau. We could do that if everyone put in a couple of dollars, yeah. um, to the extent they can, to help get the messages out. But at the end of the day, it's the authenticity of the story that really makes a difference. And Bishop, um, the Bishop in Parramatta has been shut down as a result of coming out, and we see that as well. We helped a woman in um, Ballarat last year, or the year before, the year before. Um, who was fired uh, married with three kids, but would not sign a statement to say that I believe marriage is only between a man and a woman because she wanted to stand by 
her LGBTI students in an affirm that, um, and she was a person of faith, she lost her job. She, so, yeah. you know, we, wh- but these stories are really important because they show that it's not just our fight. Yeah. It's actually a fight that really cuts across lots okay. of... Um, we've got less than 10 minutes left in this room, so we probably might not get through all these questions, but can I invite you to keep it short so we've got more chance? Thanks. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to ask the panel whether they think there's opportunity to perhaps remind Australians that in New Zealand, for example, two weeks ago, there was a member of parliament who apologised that he didn't stand up for the marriage equality bill and standing beside him was his gay son. Yeah. So Australians hate being outed or beaten by New Zealanders. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, where I live in Waterloo, there is a church, an Anglican church, um, I no longer go there for my Oz Harvest food on Fridays because they had someone who'd gone through gay conversion. Um, I think it's important to remember um, the Royal Commission into institutional violence. I sat there and cried and I got the first amount of counselling I've ever had about the abuse I suffered in New Zealand. But let's go back to all the friends and allies we have. That process may not have been brought entire justice, but as the organisation I'm a member of, Samson, for male historic abuse survivors, it gave a place for people to be heard. The Royal Commission was extended, and Fitzgerald is a Catholic, but he's like me from the social justice end, and I wanted to ask, could we all here say to people who we know, hey, listen, if social justice, is, if you're going to be consistent, then mm. you need to ask those questions. Are you going to help someone but say, you've got to match our conservative values and yeah. practices? Is that an opportunity you're talking about? I, I think that's a really good point in that, um, in the circles that I'm aware of, a lot of people that are involved in social justice movements, whether it be refugee rights, whether it be climate justice, whether it be whatever, the really disgusting thing is in a lot of those contexts, people think that if I'm going to speak up on climate and be heard in the church, I can't also be an LGBT ally. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to speak up for refugees, I can't also be an ally for this. Now, justice is justice. And we actually need to support each other across those movements and stop siloing those kind of issues as well Mm -hmm. and recognise that um, justice, if it's not justice for everyone, it's not justice. Uh, And sort of join those voices together and stop being afraid of exclusion. Yeah. Hassan, do you have something? Okay. Next question. Uh, So my question is to Ghassan and to Joe in particular. Uh, We've talked a bit about Mark Latham's religious freedom bill. We haven't talked yet about his other bill, his anti-trans kids bill, which is actually an even worse attack on our communities. It's been almost 12 months since that bill was introduced. Mm. The Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, the opposition leader, Jody McKay, have never come out and condemned it. Every day that they refuse to condemn it, they are saying that a transphobic debate, an attack on trans kids, is okay. How bad do you think it will get? Or what do you think we can do for them, for Gladys Berejiklian and the new opposition leader, Chris Minns, to finally say, actually, erasing trans and non-binary kids is not OK? Good question. Gassan? Uh, well, look, that bill is horrendous and unacceptable. Yeah. It, there's also a campaign on our website about that, and we've had thousands of people write through, um, through our website on that issue. And when I appeared um, before the parliamentary inquiry on that, um, which it should never have got to that far, but with parents of kids um, who are, you know, at school who are trans or gender diverse, um, it's heartbreaking. I, I can't believe we're in a place where we're having a debate about this. Um, so hop online and have your voice heard. Stand with these, these young people as they're making their way in the world. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I think it will get worse. I think it's a testing the, the ground. Latham knows he won't get it through. It's testing. If you look at places, you know, my native country, England, um, particularly England, trans, rather than the whole of the UK, but there's been a move back. Transphobia has risen. They're going back on proposals in the government. Um, it's going to make it worse. And I, I, I think, like with this issue, it's very, very painful for trans people, as it is for people of faith in the next few um, months and years. Um, sadly, it's an expression of the fact we are visible and we, we're not going away. Um, so we need to do all that we can to support one another. So it's back again to working together and making sure that we stand together. And this isn't just an issue for trans people. or That's not just an issue for people of, of um, faith or for Aboriginal people. We have to work together for a better Australia. 
Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Rev Comrade Rowley, and I'm a transgender male asexual survivor of institutionalized abuse, and I'm also ordained with the Universal Life Church. Um, my question is, um, I've got two questions. Firstly, um, is it possible to have another queer thinking to address this issue? Because this is the first time that a space has included um, transgender people of faith um, to speak on the platform. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, will you guys commit to the next transgender rights protest um, organised by Community Action for Rainbow Rights? Because I think that um, it's important for our stories to be heard and it's important to create spaces like this where our voices are heard. But I think we've, um, in order to make real change happen, we've got to put our prayers into organised action. Thanks. Who wants to take that? Yes, I mean, yeah, we need to keep going with this. The issues have started to, ra I'd say, I mean, it's, it is going to be difficult for Trat and it is, in, especially in Sydney at the moment. We're going backwards and on trans. So we have, to, we have to listen to one another and support one another, especially kids. And it, it's significant that it's education because we know that's where the that's where the depth of suicide and mental distress, um, lack of achievement, the mm. basis of a whole lot of other things happen. So they're going right to the, to right into the, to hurt the most marginal people in our communities, and it's not acceptable. Do you think the danger is that the the ones who would mount the campaign and campaign for these bills? Um, zero in on the trans because they think that's where people are least comfortable. Yep. Um, but if we, the opportunity might be with this debate to tell the stories of the kids and when mm. you hear the stories of the kids, yes. you can't help but be yeah. mm. yes. heartbroken. And in the Latham case, I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, if, you know, would you, you want your child, this is, I think, I'd like to know, my grandchildren would know a little bit about Islam, for example, or something. I think there is yeah. a debate about that. But wouldn't you want to know about the diversity of people that are in Australia? That's what we're providing. Yeah. Whether or not your child is trans or not, it's about, you know, being uh, the common good. So this basket is back. I mean, churches often go on about the common good. You know, lots of, right, that's part of our, especially in the Catholic mm. Church. Mm. But that's what we have to say. What is the best for the common good, yeah. not just for, for mm -hmm. individuals or, yeah. or a individual institution? We need a badge that says we are all God's children. Um, yeah. OK, yeah, I, think, like I think we've actually only got time for one more question. <laughs> Amazing. Hi there. Um, my name's Lily. Um, and I'm a student at a university that doesn't allow um, LGBT lifestyle, whatever that even means. <laughs> mm. um, I'm wondering if you guys can imagine a world where schools are, are not allowed to expel students, upper, like upper level schools, um, like. Yeah. Yes. And, if and this, not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where schools can't exclude. Yes, yeah. 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 Do yeah. you guys imagine that happening 100%. in the next I can. Okay, you don't hang on, have hang to on, imagine hang on, it. Joe, before we get there, is that you're at a university now that will not allow? Yes. In Australia or? Yes. <laughs> what is that university? We will not speak about it here. I'll talk okay. to you later. Okay. I've got a good Because hunch. And the only reason I say that is because we're all um, sort of, I and get it. all of us have like visas that are tied to these things as yeah. well. So it does become a really big um, issue for people to come out. So, I see. Okay. Yeah. Joe, let's get an answer from everyone on this. Yes. Um, when I was up in Brisbane, southern Queensland, it's the policy of the Anglican Diocese of, Sydney, of, mm. of Brisbane, south Queensland, that trans people should get the best model care for kids. So it's absolutely impossible to expel trans kids from schools on those grounds, or indeed as gay people from mm. Anglican schools. Mm. So it can be done by religious groups. It can be done, and I think we can change that. Tasmania is a good example where those exemptions don't exist and a number of states and territories have better laws than our federal laws and certainly New South Wales is like the worst because they just say blanket. We don't even need to ask if it's a private educational institution. But one thing I've noticed is when people find out, especially people who pay a lot of money to send their, um, their children or themselves to these private institutional yeah. um, when they find out these policies, they're absolutely appalled, and I've seen examples of them take their kids out of schools. Um, so sometimes if the pressure on 
you know, the, the morality yeah. of the cause doesn't the money. work, then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go the, money the money lost does. Uh, Gassan, mm. isn't this what the Ruddock recommendation would change and the Prime Minister's committed to? Yes, but, I mean, the commitment was made, I think, 2018. I understand, but... And, yeah, and um, it's, a simple, it's a simple change of law. Yeah. Um, yeah. It hasn't been done. Hussain? Yes, is my short response. Um, I was lucky that I went to a university that had um, maybe, I don't know if it was because I studied communications, there's a lot more creative, creative minds, but I was lucky to be in a university that fostered and loved and embraced um, me as, mm. as who I was, and I sure hope that is the future. Mm -hmm. Karen? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's not too long ago that we had to imagine a time when there could be freedom for Jewish people in religious institutions, when there could be integration of people in, of colour in our religious institutions, when divorced people were not able to teach in Christian schools in Australia. I'm talking like 20 years ago. Um, and so absolutely I can imagine that. I understand that the denomination that kicked me out, the Baptist denomination, when people first started the Baptist movement, as it was back in the time, the church as a whole, the broad church around that, responded by drowning people that believed in baptism. So Baptists were killed for their belief. But that changed over time, right? We don't drown Baptists anymore, but we let them kick out the gays. Um, <laughs> What I'm saying is there is a trajectory of hope, I believe. You know, I believe in that trajectory of restoration and redemption. So I can 100% believe it. Um, and I wait for that day and I hope that it's coming soon. And on that note, I think we should all trust in a trajectory of hope. Could you please thank our <laughs> panel? Karen Pat, Christine Corley, Joey Ken and Gus Ancastasia. Such a tremendous discussion and so important at that moment. So I'd like to thank all of you two for coming out today to be part of this at this time. It's obviously time we need to get our heads together, get our heads around what's going on in faith communities. The government has given us a timeline. The Attorney General says she will introduce a law uh, by December into the Parliament. So we will have this discussion in the months ahead. Um, so we need to be able to meet it uh, with support, argument and debate. Equality Australia, as um, Gassan has told us, has a Freedom From Discrimination petition. If you want to sign it and share it, you can visit equalityaustralia.org.au for more information. On behalf of Equality Australia and Sydney Mardi Gras, thank you to the panel. Thank you, all of you. Thanks to our Auslan interpreting team, Liz and Leah, for their work. Yeah. And thanks again to all of you for turning up and turning out. And we hope you really got some value out of today's discussion. If you don't have any plans for the rest of the day, please, there are still tickets available for My Drag Story and the DJ spin-off competition. Visit mardigras.org.au for more information for those tickets. And remember, as we leave, please keep COVID safe. Mm. Follow the directions from the venue as you're leaving. Social distancing is the name of the game. Bloody COVID, but we've just got to do what we've got to do. Thank you, all of you. Thanks. Thank you.